I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. Today, I am with Jerry Northrup in um, upstate New York, the western portion of it. Uh, I'm in Lithuania, and um, we are co-leading the uh, study group for the language of wisdom. And that's because both of us have something very much in common that uh, throughout our lives, uh, we've been developing uh, these uh, languages of wisdom, and maybe it's the same language of wisdom. So uh, this is our attempt just to um, think about the meta level. You know, now that there's two of us, we can start to look a little bit more like, well, what are we doing? <laughs> you see, And not just focus so much on the content of what we're saying, but focus on like, well, why are we saying that? Because that's maybe where we will definitely find commonality. So we're trying to uh, learn to do this, the two of us. Uh, we want to um, maybe every other meeting expand that with other people we invite, um, who are, which could be certainly you. Join the Math for Wisdom discussion group by email. You'll find out more at the bottom of this video. And so welcome, Jerry. And why don't we start by uh, you maybe explaining, um, well, what would you like to achieve with your language? Okay. Um, I have been involved for a long time, uh, 50, 60 years on a, on a basic project of uh, how people think and what to do about critical issues like the environment, climate change, uh, extreme wealth inequality, and, and what that derives. And I've been looking for um, colleagues, other people who are interested in this, this kind of thing. And, and finally, I got introduced to Andreas, and my conclusion is there that he and I share a worldview that is very similar, and it is quite different than uh, what I perceive as the dominant worldview of, of society now, which is a mechanistic paradigm based on, on theoretical physics. So the notion uh, in terms of, of what Andreas's language of wisdom is, the whether what how and why uh, resonates with my view in terms of a language that I created um, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Uh, I created a, a series of languages. And the notion is to how to get people to think more clearly so that a lot of the things that are being, that happen now in society and what have you, that really seem incredibly destructive and, and um, harmful uh, can become clear as, as to why people shouldn't do that and, and how we move forward with it. So I see this as a, as a program uh, in terms of, of how we think and how we think with language and how that really, uh, if, if we understand that more clearly, uh, we will start to do things that are, are less destructive to society and, and to uh, the environment and so i'm i'm looking forward to exploring how we can emerge andreas's vision with my vision and how that can be explained and um, um, get out to see if, if people like that and if that can make a difference i have an extensive background in terms of working with large-scale environmental biotechnologies and this involves a, a program called timberfish which um, can take food waste, combine them with wood chips, grow microbes, grow invertebrates, grow fish, generate renewable energy, generate clean water, a food source, all in a renewable, renewable circular green economy on a local scale. So I would like to see that extended. That's not something I can be as directly involved with anymore, um, but I think it's a great hope for the future. And so how do we develop an understanding of that that then goes beyond environmental biotechnology and gets into the, you know, the sociology, the, the, how society functions, how people function. And I see this as an opportunity to, um, to do that in the collaboration with Andreas, who I think has a language which is similar, I think in some ways, a simpler, easier approach than what I've done with the, the language I've had. 
um, and that this may merge together to yield something that would be um, a very useful. My wife, who's an artist, has this concept of a seed crystal and that how if we could formulate the idea clearly and carefully enough and drop it into the internet, that it could change the way people think in, on a global scale in a relatively short period of time. I would be very interested if, if we can put together something that can act in that kind of way. So, you know, the, the participation here is, is uh, open. I will make available everything that, that we have done with Timberfish and the philosophical structure and the language. And hopefully that's of interest to some people and that we can find a way to get that so that it, it is uh, incorporated into real economic applications, this notion of a circular green economy that is based on cooperative interaction and not autocratic forms of, of government. So I'm very excited about this and, and hope we get a lot of people who are interested as well and, and want to come along. So what I'm delighted to be working with Andreas. It's very rare that I I find somebody that has the same sort of peculiar view of the universe that I have. So I'm very hopeful here. And I'm very uh, well glad to uh, have this, uh, well, to have you. And so, uh, you know, a person who is uh, looking at the life in a very similar way, a holistic way, I would say, you know, who, yes. um, and so when we think holistically, we, we are very interested in the big picture. And when you look at the big picture, the details can somehow um, be not so important, but to try to get the outlines of well, what's going on. Right. Overall. So ever since childhood, I wanted, I thought that the most useful, best thing I could do would be to know everything, but apply that knowledge usefully. So, um, well, it's, you know, I'm 58 now, so I've been working on this philosophy since I was 18, um, focusing, documenting the limits of my imagination. And so basically, maybe um, where it's led is a language of cognitive frameworks uh, that kind of map out the perspectives that we can take up and the choices that we can have amongst them. And this uh, goal of um, applying that by having a culture, a community, a civilization of independent thinkers around the world who basically can independently verify and testify to, you know, what's our reality, you know, from coming from inside. Um, and so to include um, the big picture, uh, namely God, in as much as there is a God or can be a God, but, you know, in as much as God is an independent thinker, in as much as we can understand God by mastering those same limits that we live in and appreciating, well, what's the message behind that? And what does that say about, you know, everything, the totality or whatever, the spirit beyond that? So um that's my goal and it's very much uh as your wife uh, artist uh, lynn uh says it's about developing the seed crystal so like and so this is a type of collaboration with god like our job is to get it right but god will scale it you see we don't have to you know control the whole world right we have to build the key we have to design the kind of like the thing that'll work so the first is to get the ideas right um and uh, that's this knowledge of ourselves, a knowledge of the, the the life that we live in and the way we interact with others. I think I'm getting pretty good on that. And so I can appreciate in your work, oh, I see commonality. So first is getting that uh, spiritual, uh, mental, intellectual, emotional seed. Uh, mm -hmm. But then uh, the next uh, part of that seed is, well, we need a tiny community. We need a tiny scientific community. We need to get that going. And so it's very exciting to have you to have this study group. Uh, we decided to call it the language of wisdom uh, study group. Uh, although like your background's in biology, so you have all this biological thinking, you have a PhD in biophysics, you have this uh, work in environmental um, solutions. Uh, we have another study group led by Aslam uh, Kakar on uh, sociology. Uh, so I co-lead that with him. We have another so study group on um, uh, math for divisions of everything, which are like the basic cognitive framework. So, I co-lead that with uh, John Harland, who has a passion for physics. Uh, we are very much possibly having another study group with uh, Jinan Kodopuli in Kerala, India, 
on natural cognition. So on the kind of like uh, fundamental way we think as children, as illiterate people, let's say, uh, and the creativity and maybe primacy of that. Uh, we may have another um, study group on uh, dialogue on what uh, Christer uh, Nylander calls uh, curious listening dialogue. So you can see that these are different facets of this uh, seed crystal that are very highly relevant. They're just happening because of the people who are coming together in the Math for Wisdom discussion group. I can also add, so the first people like uh, my friends John or Thomas were people I knew, maybe some people from the uh, Laboratory of Independent Thinkers, uh, Minshu Soldis, or referred by them. But now we're getting the very first people who watch our YouTube videos. And uh, some of those videos, um, we have a first video that's reaching 3,000 views, which is on category theory and how the whether, what, how, why levels of knowledge reflect in the Yoneda embedding. That I submitted to a conference on applied category theory, and it was rejected three times by the reviewers. They said, we do not understand what you're talking about. It got rejected by a philosophy of mind conference. They wouldn't explain why. But for some reason, um, after five minutes of really not being viewed, it all of a sudden just took off and steadily people are watching. And, you know, these are people with um, masters in computer science degrees or business consultants or, you know, different people. But I want to say that that's not necessarily the, I mean, that's encouraging that this type of cognitive framework could be um, meaningful to other people. I'm trying to say that this is real. Like, how can we think without language? How can we think with what came before language, uh, the, the mental abilities we have, these cognitive frameworks? But actually, like, um, one of the most important uh, videos turned out to be um, uh, a, a conversation I did with uh, Harris Shekharis about his uh, relationship with truth. So I've been asking people, I'll ask you today, you know, what is your relationship with truth? Uh, what's your deepest value in life, which includes all your other values? I think you maybe have told me, but uh, but we never really uh, double checked if that was maybe what you what you thought. Uh, but um, uh, so to come back to that, but um, so that video, you know, got maybe 50 views, maybe actually five people saw the whole thing. But one of them became a Patreon supporter, the very first Patreon supporter who um, was somebody I didn't know. OK, so that means that, wow, you know, so all of a sudden YouTube is helping the artificial intelligence and YouTube is figuring out in the world who are these people uh, that is on our side. And so um, another person who saw a video that was uh, banned by the Summer of Math Exposition, they said, your video is so cranky, unscientific, you know, this was the binomial portal theorem is a portal to your mind, you see. So it turns out that, well, one of the people who watched that has a community very much like mine, and he just uh, joined our discussion group too. So hopefully we'll be able to introduce him. So I'm just saying like, you don't know which video and you know what the viewership is really relevant in terms of, but actually who is, the real thing is, well, who's joining, you see? And so I like having these, like what we're having today, maybe 50 people will watch it, maybe 100, you know, actually 10% will have actually seen it, maybe, you know, gotten this far in the video. But but those could be the people that we really are trying to reach. That's what it's about. And also to foster the sense of community, which we're managing to achieve. You know, this is how we get to know each other. So I think uh, that's what I wanted to say as an introduction. And then maybe I would ask you, before I forget, so... What is your relationship with truth? Oh. Unfortunately, this part of our conversation did not get recorded because of a technological failure. However, I did uh, write down Jerry's relationship with the truth. For Jerry, truth is a guiding principle of compassionate cooperation within the constraints of evidence. In short, uh, as he'll uh, say subsequently, truth is aesthetic, or I would uh, rephrase that simply as truth as beauty. Uh, so Jerry, I that helps me understand you. And then if, just if this is mostly pragmatic, but if we were to use one word, would it be truth as compassion or truth as cooperation? Or is there another word? Or or truth as a guide? Well, I, I, I like 
to use the word that that truth is aesthetic. Aesthetic is or a aesthetic, yeah. Aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Ar artistic, aesthetic. It's the beautiful. Truth is beautiful. And the world is beautiful. The universe is beautiful. Truth is aesthetic. So truth is uh but compassionate, cooperative. No, which have no whatever whatever that you would say, but what yeah. you're saying is that truth is beautiful. Is that what you're yeah, yes. Truth is beautiful, right? That's how you yeah. and it's a the guiding principle of compassionate cooperation within the constraints of evidence. Is that uh yeah, that's that's, that's an interesting close. definition of beauty, but I think that that's uh that's not so you know that yeah okay. Yeah, you need to think about it, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I we can you can update it, it or correct it, but at least so that uh, yeah. that's a lot to think about. Um yeah. I, I have a comment here about yeah. what we were talking about before, about your and this comes back to the what, how, why, whether, or mm -hmm. whether, what, how, why. Yes. And that is I understand your goal of the small community of thinkers and and the uh exploration of the ideas and, and how to derive at an understanding of, of the universe and what have you. My question is, and and the, the how is, in a sense, is that you're putting out the videos, that that's sort of what you're doing. But how does, my question is, how does that actually change the world? How is that going to impact what we see the autocrats and what have you doing that is destructive both to the environment and to the uh, to society because the the focus i see is is that we have to we have to do something we have to act to try and change that and i think we have to do it relatively soon so i think um you know it's um it's very. I can understand your concern. Um, Part of that's because I'm 81 too. I mean, yes, you know, and so it's you know I'm 58, so I do me. feel like an old man myself. Uh, you know, I do feel huh. like an old age, uh, well, and, and I also have a concern. Like I got to get going. You know, I get moving. Right? So yeah. I, so, but I'm, I'm a little bit younger in the sense that I understand. Like, I can do it once right. You see, I don't have time to mess things up. Yeah. So it's very. Uh, so I'm not. I'm not desperate. It's like I need to do it right. I need to ignore all these other options. You know, I need to do it yeah. what is the right way, right? And so, yeah. number one, number two, um, the right way is basically saying uh, I think like the root problem behind climate change and all these types of things is maybe very much related to what you were saying. It's that uh, uh, the lack of solidarity between people. You see, if people cared about each other, we would yeah. just look at these things entirely differently. You know, if we would be sharing. About, if people so, really care about each other, we wouldn't have extreme wealth inequality. For ex yeah. So, or, or even if we if we did, but it would function very differently. It would be serving us. You know. So, you know, like uh, I have written, co-written this paper, uh, an economy for giving everything away, and it just says basically like what we have should be for the best use of all. And it can be argued that, you know, someone who's a very good organizer, very uh, passionate, and very good giving person should have, you know, hundreds of millions, maybe hundreds of billions of dollars, you know, uh, because they're good at sharing that, you know, so like maybe Bill Gates is more effective than your typical government. I don't know. I'm not going to judge him on that. You know, I have my doubts, you know, I, I'm more in favor of uh, Linux, let's say, right, than uh, Microsoft, you know, so, but uh, let well, people... Tim, Tim Berners-Lee, for example... Yeah, so I mean, that, that well, and money is money, you know, thing. money is not a, a spiritual commodity. So, um, mm. but the point being that, uh, how can we, um, have this attitude of solidarity of uh, brotherhood and sisterhood, right? Where all these problems then become not problems, they just all become, you know, it's our wanting to solve the climate change problem without resorting to solidarity. You see, that's the issue that we need technical solutions or we need you know, some kind of government solutions or whatever, like, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, I've been, um, I mean, when when you get it right, you know, things like go viral, change can be dramatically. Right. That's, that's so the a, a personal concept. example, 
Yeah. That paper that I co-wrote with uh, my friend and elder uh, brother, David Ellison Bay, who passed away uh, maybe last year, maybe the year before. But uh, a, a high school student, uh, Chris Messina, read that. And he became uh, very uh, prominent in Silicon Valley. And he was the one who invented the hashtag. And he said that that paper that I co-wrote was the reason that he um, it was the major influence on the hashtag, like to give it away, to not uh, trademark it, you know, to yeah. not let Twitter trademark it. You see, right. because Twitter, you know, there are all these things that say, no, 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 like, that doesn't you don't own the hashtag hashtag belongs to everybody now yeah. hashtag belongs to the me too movement but it also belongs to donald trump you know stop the steal it belongs to everybody but like so to have been a person and nobody knows right but we know and he was kind enough like to say that publicly to say that in a tedx video etc that you know hey like there's this guy under skolikowskis and i would add my friend uh, brother and i was living in the south side of chicago in the neighborhood of inglewood with my friend brother david ellison bay and we were, uh, you know, a completely distraught neighborhood where one in a thousand is murdered every year, you see. And I was jobless and I was writing um, to a contest uh, in India by uh, some MIT Media Lab students had this think cycle where they wanted to, you know, have open source innovation, let's say. And we won a prize um, for this paper. Uh, maybe there were maybe 10 prizes, but so... We were counted as coming from a developing country. You see, they had funds to invite people from. I had no money to go, but they had funds to invite it because I was from Lithuania. You see, there was another from Estonia. We got to go from developing countries, you know, to India. They travel, and so um, that's where I met Jinnan. You see, I've never really met him except wow. for that conference twenty years ago. But just to say, so that was the reward I got for that paper. But uh, billions of people have been affected, and uh, so it's just marvelous. Uh, that happened immediately. No one knows, but to I know, and so you know now. People maybe more. What, what know. was David Ellison's last name? David Ellison Bay, and so that's uh, he's a Moor. He was a Grand Sheik of the Moor Science Temple of America, and what they would do uh, to emphasize that they're not uh, black or colored or Negro, uh, but they have a nation, they're the Moors, and so they would they're free people. So they would add the um, either the suffix Bay or the prefix L. They would add to their last names, so it's Ellison Bay, B E Y, and so just cool. Like so, who knew? Like that the hashtag was influenced by Inglewood, Chicago, and by the Moors. Let's say the Moors since Science Temple America, and and me, who he included in you know within his house. Uh, it's just fascinating for me, at least. So God scales. We don't have to worry about that. You see, we need to worry about like we need to be very careful about getting it right. Uh, I do. At yeah. least, if you like this moral. So I, I agree. You see, so you have this uh, notion of beauty, compassion, cooperation. It kind of see and that helps to kind of read your works, um, which I'll give links to in the description below. Uh, the philosopher's dream and the relational symmetry paradigm. Whereas like my view is much more extreme and careful. It's about absolute uh, view. It's about absolute truth. So I have to be extremely careful in what I say. Um, and I may not talk about all the things out there, but start like just with what is it that I really could know myself. So like, I don't know if the universe exists, you know, like what do I know about the universe, right? Like I've never been there. Right? Like, so I, I mean, I've just been in my house, basically, right? So or I'm in my yard, right? And they're talking about some kind of universe, right? So I don't want to base things on some kind of universe, but I do know about the concept of everything. You see, in my mind, there's a concept of everything. And I can tell you it has four properties. Uh, it has no external context. You know, it's if you put it in a box, it includes a box. It has no internal structure. It could be chaotic or orderly, but it is what it is. So all things are true about everything because you really can't get it. Like everything is hot. Everything is cold. Everything is good. Everything is bad. Um, it's the simplest algorithm, simplest procedure, whatever you think of, you dump into everything. So you can be a poet or a philosopher. You can be a man or a woman. It's the same everything. You know, you just whatever you think of, you can throw in God, throw in everything itself, throw in me, throw in you. It's all part of everything. And it's uh, a required concept, like we all have it, uh, we can't get rid of it, we couldn't have learned it because everything we see and learn is bounded, 
but everything is unbounded. So I know that those are the four properties of everything. I, I've never seen other properties. Now, if there were more properties, you know, Dave Gray asked, like, was well, your theory testable? Well, that'd be one of the tests to say, look, like, you could find a fifth property of everything. You know, I'm in trouble. Uh, I'd have to do a lot of, you know, I don't think that my thing, my whole, my, you know, language would collapse, but I don't think it will. Well, I don't know. I, it doesn't seem to. So that's where things stand. So the, then it comes back to how. How do we get this so that it actually makes a difference? How do we get this so that it can influence uh, Putin or Xi or Trump or those folks? Okay, I'm back. Okay. What were we talking about? Theory of everything and, and how you have to be so concerned about getting it right, being very careful about getting it right. Yeah. So, you know, like, I mean, so that's that's why I look that, at your, um, um, I'm old enough, you know, and maybe... Uh, wise enough maybe even like you know i look at your work and i i read it on many different levels and so you know i read it as a mathematician a physicist i mean you have a phd in biophysics uh, uh, we met uh through john bias's uh talk right. on bot periodicity right and i spoke about yeah. the moral you know look right. you, you used two words that, that struck me you choice said choice and, and value yeah and, and then uh, so that's why i looked you up and yes and and it was also the same uh, talk uh, that where I engaged um, Francis right. uh, Howard, you know. Right. So that's the kind of place. So you see, I spent three months in America. I couldn't find anybody except for one person was Aslam Kakal, who's active, you know, in our group. Uh, right. There may be a few more who would become more active, uh, Samuel Hutchins, uh, Brent Shambo, uh, and more. But um, But you see, that one meeting, you yeah. found me and I found... Uh, and it's to the credit of John Bias, who I think thinks I'm a crank, you know, like, but, but he was, but see, I was, uh, I have a PhD in math and I was able to frame my question in a way where like, it was not uh, embarrassing, you know, it was just different, you know, so, um, and so maybe I'm a crank to him now, but maybe in a year I won't be, you see. Yeah. And, um, you know, or David Spivak, you know, I was at the Applied Category Theory Conference trying to engage people. Uh, so I told him, you know, he's he's the elder in that community, although he's uh, much younger than me, I think. But um, he said, basically, whether, what, how, why, he goes, that's like Borges' uh, uh, short story on the emperor, is, you know, scholars' categories, you know, which is, you know, about like, all these funky categories that you can have that are just completely ridiculous, you see, basically ridiculed. I see. Yeah. So I'm just saying now, and he's a person who's very dedicated to try to know everything, you know, and he has in his own kind of way, like through dynamical systems, through he has this uh, category, I think it's called uh, poly, you know, like this kind of polynomial type category, polynomial functor type category. So he has his own way, but he couldn't see this. It was behind. So I saw in you, oh, See, you are thinking similar as I'm thinking. But you see, you're thinking aesthetically in a lot of places where I would not think aesthetically. I mean, I do think aesthetically in many ways. And so I use aesthetic guide. But yeah. as a last resort, in a very careful way, I like to say, you know, when there is no when there is no thing, when there is no way to know, then I use that. But I don't, I avoid it. So when I read your works, I there's a lot of aesthetic layer to it. And it just, I have to kind of like put it aside, put it aside, put it aside, yeah. put it aside, and just focus on that five or 10% that says, but this is very um, intriguing. So like what's very intriguing is, you know, you have these four levels of the relational, you're basically saying there's four types of uh, relations, right? right? And then you have two ways of looking at that, you see, and so that could be very deep, because basically, I end up with a similar type of thing, right? And as we spoke uh, in our previous meeting, uh, I could start to see, a, on the one hand, a deep connection, on the one hand, like a deep criticism, saying right. that, like, I think it is. So we, we may we may publish that. I would need to get you through that, and I need to kind of edit maybe parts of that out. But it's kind of interesting or useful to go back to that and to say, you know, that is like, there is a deep criticism there. Uh, so I think your question, though, I want to get to is like, well, okay, so how do we get things moving, right? Let's say we both have this, That's you know, not, we have different The real styles. question is, how, how do we get this actually applied? How do we do something? And and that's based on my experience with these big biological systems. Right. Because like you run a big wastewater treatment plant or something, every day mm -hmm. you get 
uh, 10 cubic yards of solid waste come in, you have to do something with it. There's no right. saying, well, we'll put, a, put it aside and study and do it tomorrow. You, you've got to deal with it. And I think, you know, from my perspective, I'm not going to pay the price of what's happened with the environment and, and the autocracy, but um, I'm concerned about that. And I feel we need to do something about that on, as relatively quickly. And how do we get get that as opposed to continuing to study it? Uh, well, how do you so so I guess maybe doing something. Uh, there's several things lurking there. Um, and uh, one is different value systems. So maybe I would even start with that because to make sure we get to that. I wanted to ask about your deepest value. What is your deepest value in life, which includes all your other values? I guess I don't quite understand what you mean by value. Well, so value um, in the simple sense. So like uh, people, you know, people value different things. I mean, like, and but the idea is that you, how do you integrate all of your values? So for one person, it could be harmony. Oh. For another person, it is beauty. It uh, could be God. It could be love. It could be uh, okay. freedom. It's, it could be it's faith. something like, like you do the best you can. You do no harm. And it can be something like that. If but that would be yeah. is that what to do the best that you can? Sort of, that would be sort of it. That that if you have the ability, the opportunity to, to do good, you should do that. Do good where you can. Yeah, wherever do, you can. Do the best you can. Do the best you and can. And do no harm. Yeah. I could say happiness. I don't know. Uh, well, the it's you can say uh, whatever you want, but the that's the point. It's like, well, would you want to say like you know how do you integrate it all? Like you know, so like that's a conflict there. Like, do the best you can, but do you do no harm? How do you integrate that? Right, that's a question. That's what we're looking for. How do you how do you decide? Sure. Yeah, well, that, that that's what you have to do all the time. You well, so how do you do resolve it? that? How do you resolve it? Uh, you make decisions based on the evidence that you have as to how the universe really works. That comes back to this maximum entropy principle and, and the notion of evidence. So you see things that don't work or things that, that cause harm. And so you use that to modify the decisions you make to do the best you can and do no harm. So you use your experience and you, you try and validate the experience with evidence so that you're not doing something stupid. Like if you say, well, I believe that rocks don't fall down and you stand underneath a cliff and a rock comes down, you say, well, it's not gonna hit me. That's that's stupid in a way because you're going counter to, to evidence. Well, you do the same thing in, in terms of how you interact with people. So, uh, so, that, how, so how, do we, how do you fit all that together? You well, have three things there, like do the best you can, do no harm, and then, a you know, pay attention to the evidence, right? My right. Evidence. You have to integrate all three. So how do you and integrate those three? I, I integrate that with this, what I call the Goldilocks maximum entropy principle, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it, it's based on fundamentally the concept of entropy and then how Ed Jane's put that into the maximum entropy principle. But to calculate it mathematically, you can only do it on very, very small mm -hmm. um, levels where you you have a situation that is described by an exhaustive hypothesis with a finite set of inferences based on the hypothesis. You can't use that very often, but you can get an aesthetic sense as to how that works. And, and so you use that way. That's where it comes into what is the, the most beautiful. It's, it's I call it Goldilocks because it's, is this too much, too little, or about right? How do you make those? Those are intuitive aesthetic judgments. And you try and use that where you can't calculate something mathematically to, you know, you do the best you can. You try not to hurt anybody else. And, and um... so then maybe that's just, I mean, so it's intuitive aesthetic judgment to, yeah. to do the best you can. 
right. and not hurt anybody else, right? And and do yeah. no harm, right? There you go. Okay. So that's your deepest voice. So I can list these, right? And then uh, you can change them or correct them if as sure. needed. But that's a and so the idea, so one of the findings of this wondrous wisdom or just this research, and so some of these things are like top down, just introspecting, you know, or just or just inquiring or wrestling with myself, let's say, but other things are um empirical. This is empirical, you know, I don't control right. you. I well, I chose the question, right? But if I choose this question, if I get an answer, I've gotten like more than 800 answers from people, but now I've started asking the two questions together. So 800 on the deepest values, but now maybe let's say 30 on the relationships with truth also. And um, what seems to happen is that um, the relationships of truth are somewhere sitting on this landscape where people are trying to connect, um, have a correspondence between two different minds. You know, like in your case, like, you know, there's a constraining mind that says, look, like the world is out there. There's another mind that says, but this is what we want. And then how do you make those fit? Right. Like, um, you know, right. so that you you use your aesthetic judgment, let's say, to make them fit. So truth has beauty in a sense or truth has an aesthetic. Right. Um, so but other people do it another way. Some people do it out. They push it out in the real world. They say, well, I have different areas, you know, different areas of life. And in each area of life truth is doing things the right way, you know, in my family, at work, etc. right? So they've pushed it out there. For somebody else like me, it's like, well, truth is absolute view. Like, you know, like for John Brett, it's truth is a metaphor, right? For Kirby, it's truth is a defensive strategy, right? So they're dealing with the same things, but they're dealing it in different levels of reality. Like for me, truth is absolute view. It's like God is behind me looking through me, let's say. So how does God somehow? But anyway, so Everyone seems to know what truth is, but when we talk about it, we talk about it in very mature ways from very different perspectives. And those seem fixed, like we're trees that are rooted. You know, we don't move around in that landscape. But if God looks through us, if this spirit of love, you know, in all its multidimension looks through it, it'll come up with a particular aspect of love um, that shows what things look like through our points of view so then that spirit so if you take that you know truth as an aesthetic or truth as beautiful where truth uh, is a guiding principle of compassion and cooperation with the constraint within the constraints of evidence and if god the spirit of truth looks through that you know the spirit of love looks through that then it says oh god sees an intuitive aesthetic judgment to do the best you can and do no harm you see so all of a sudden becomes very vivid and like it becomes love, basically. Like that's a def that's one of the many definitions of love, right? Or that's one of the many aspects of love would be this intuitive aesthetic judgment, right? Like that. Okay. So my my question then is what do you do if you ask somebody like Putin what he believes? Well, you know, the question is, you know, would he give an answer? How you, but how do you but, deal with that? Well, somebody the point who is, has is that tremendous power who has what kind of view of that? So the my experience uh, is that um, you know and so first of all like people who are not very mature they won't even be able to say it they won't be you know people have you know you're a mature independent thinker so you're able to say it I would suspect that he maybe can answer that uh, but the point is is that um, and it may be a lovely thing it's just that it's our strong point and our weak point you see so. And and people, but it's very useful. It would be very useful to know because then we would know how to engage him. You see, we're not doing very good job in terms of engaging him in terms of his values. And his okay. values are not something like money or whatever. Like he has some kind of weird view of, you know, but in that weird view, like he has something that's maybe completely understandable or even loving, so to speak. But we just don't, it's just a mystery. It's kind of hidden from us and we're not connecting with it. And so we're not getting anywhere with him. I think that's the issue. And we're not doing things to help to get to him, you see. So we're not uh, We're well, not interested to know. So, so what, you know, how, how do we deal with that kind of situation? I mean, it, it's arguably that he is probably one of the richest people in the world. So that goes back to this extreme wealth well, inequality. Well, that kind Russia, of I mean, how, how do you deal with that? How do we address those kinds of people? 
Well, so first of all, like Russia has the GDP of Mexico and Russia has the population of Bangladesh. Like, you know, Russia's, right. you know, Russia has some nuclear weapons, but, you know, are they going to use them? You know, so um, and then what can we do? Like if, if we wanted to, we could uh, look at the ways Putin figures things out, like look at the ways he talks in his speeches and look at the ways he talks in interviews. There's enough information um, where you could piece together like a scheme, a cheat sheet, the 24 ways that Putin looks at the world. And then that would be very helpful, like to try to, you know, figure out. And I, I bet you his deepest value probably could be teased out from that. So that's the kind of one way to crack a person, even, you know, just based on what they say, that it'll, it'll well, creep how, out. So how do you get to him? No, just how, based how on his speeches, based on what he says, it, it probably, you know, 90% of what he says is probably like in certain sense, it's honest, you know. So I, I just think that there's more important things to do, you know, like than to worry about that. Like we, when things, when we do things right, things will work on our favor very quickly, very strongly. So the question is uh, how to do things right. And um, okay. and so to do things right, like where's that at? Like, uh, so, you know, uh, I'm focusing on writing out my philosophy. You know, you've done it, uh, you know, you've done a good job with these texts. Uh, I've done it 10 years ago with this book, the, from, from Relative Truth to Absolute Truth. Uh, uh, but I need, uh, I have so much more achieved now and I'm getting much more to the concluding. So I need to uh, do that. That'll take a year or so okay. to probably do it with videos. Then maybe I'll be able to do, like like you said, to do shorter videos or to do whatever. But um, what's very exciting now is uh, having these study groups with you and with others, building this community, really trying to uh, learn how to investigate things in a true way. So one of the things that you can attribute, you know, you have an aesthetic, but I think one of the things I think you could contribute very much is your biological perspective, you see, right. but in including like the whole like ecological cycles of the waste management, etc., uh, which include economic cycles, right? Like you have a huge amount of intuition where like the way you think about that philosophically may give some clues, but there may be other ways to think about it. But basically, like the reality that you're talking is something like, can you show to us the reality we're talking about it? Can we kind of like absorb it and maybe rethink it or reconfigure it and say, OK, this is this is a way to do it. Right. Like so. So yeah. your language is a good step towards interfacing with that. But like you've you've had many iterations of your language. Maybe there'll be one more, you know, like and also like. Your, the purpose of your language is to be pragmatic, to say, um, why don't we start here, right? It's it's a guidance document to help me understand and try and, and put it together. I, it, yeah. Difficult. It's not really a, a language you can speak. You probably could. I have mm -hmm. done that. So I will I will write something out in auto do that, that talks about whether, what, how, and why. But, See, where, where, uh, whereas... And so like you've done a whole language and then, but you've done it at a kind of like a um, approximate level. You know, you yeah. have an approximation of a whole language. Whereas I have like pieces of language, right. but they're like on the, I think they're on the absolute level. Like, I think I'm catching, how do you talk about that absolute level? So when you mentioned yeah. about like God or so, or you mentioned the absolute, uh, you mentioned knowledge. I think it was um, that, you know, you approximate knowledge but there's this situation where I, the thing I think I kind of learned from what you're saying is like, when you have knowledge of something, that in some sense, it's knowledge about the absolute. But you see, the problem with knowledge is that knowing the absolute is not the absolute. Knowing the no, absolute by definition kind of like removes you from, you know, you've, you've just by knowing it already, you have kind of like messed everything up because knowledge can evoke the absolute but knowledge can't substitute for the absolute in a certain way well, I, I look at it as knowledge can approach the absolute truth mm -hmm. if such an absolute truth exists but it it's it's the approach you don't assume that there is well, or that you can get so to th there's this funky relationship with knowledge where um you so it, there may be an absolute in the way you talk about it we do deal with knowledge the question is like, how is our, what is our relationship with knowledge? Are we evoked by knowledge? So like the way memory works, right? Like you you evoke things. 
Or yeah, are we identifying with knowledge? You see, like if we identify with knowledge, that's probably a problem and we will just be wrong, you see. But if knowledge evokes us to act, you know, knowledge prompts us to act or knowledge inspires us to do things, you know, see, then the relation with knowledge is different. It's like the knowledge isn't us. We're not identifying with the knowledge just as the knowledge approximated, uh, let's say the absolute. So the knowledge is inspiring us and we in the absolute can coincide. You see, but when we try to identify with knowledge, then we can't be right because knowledge is proximate. But you see, but if we try to be inspired by knowledge, then we, and that's the beauty of aesthetics. You see, aesthetics says, um, let yourself be inspired. Yeah. You see, it's, I still think you have to come back to it on a pragmatic basis, though. So if you're talking a lot about knowledge, it comes down to then, okay, what are you going to do with it? No matter how you describe it, how you, you talk about that. What, what kind of actions does it lead to? How do we deal with the real world problems of right. pollution? So, so the first thing is to say, well, what is real? So like this three cycle of you take a stand, you follow through, you reflect, like that is real. Like if we're investigating, you know, we're yeah. trying to bridge. Our, this is an investigation. We're making efforts, right? So we're making progress. So we will try it. You know, we will attempt, we will make this, we're taking a stand to do it. Then we will uh, go forth and try then we will uh, take a look and see where it got us, you know, then we will adjust. Right. So I think the first, um, in terms of like affecting the world, I think uh, like I need to finish reading your works. Um, I could um, make small criticisms. I don't know if that's, uh, I could write into the group, for example, um, just maybe, maybe that's the simplest, sure. right? Is to write to the group. Like the way you use certain words like symmetrical or um, transcendental or et cetera. They're just not uh, standard or they're not even correct, maybe. But right. so I could just go sentence by sentence. Maybe I could do that is to go to say, you know, that this is these are changes to like instead right. of symmetrical to say analogous, let's say, would be the more or isomorphic is another word you see. OK, so to just to just to give suggestions, um, the other is. Um, but like if if I learn, I think like to tap into your biological view, because I don't have that kind of biological um, uh, wealth of knowledge. Uh, so if you could, um, if we could tap into that and then try to see, and like if we thought more about like, well, what are you trying to achieve um, from a business point of view, from a, a environmental point of view, like, and then just to think about the logic, like maybe that logic applies, you know, to uh, systems like the one you're working on, but maybe the uh, logic applies to things like, like, for example, in my backyard, I compost my human waste, let's say, right? Like, I mean, is that uh, similar to what you're doing? Or is that different what you're doing? You see, or is that maybe even better than what you're doing? You see, like, so um, how do we, um, what are things, what are different ways that we could live? Certainly people are looking for that, you know, like, what are ways of living that are ecological? People have not made that very clear, I think, for example, right? And then if you help to clarify that, then your whole industrial process may actually be much more resonant with that. Say, oh, this is just a large version of, but, the, but we could, um, you know, it's like simple question I got fired with today, like, is that ecological or not? I don't even know, you know, like, okay. uh, it be burning firewood. I'll send the link to this video that uh, Tony did a while ago, which walks you through the timberfish system that we operated here a few years ago Good. in Western New York. Please send it to our group, to right. How that actually works in the real world. Please send that to our group. And then we have a couple of minutes left. I just wanted to conclude. So then in two weeks, uh, is this a good time to meet for you? And I'm pretty well available anytime now. So whatever's most convenient for you. Just for the people on the Pacific coast, so this would be early. Like, uh, could 11 o'clock work for you? 11 o'clock or noon, whatever works for you. I'm I'm flexible with that now. Noon won't be too late for you? No. Then no, we'll no. do it noon then, okay? So then the people at 9 o'clock want to join us. Uh, and then yeah. that'll be um, 7 o'clock here. Uh, the the yeah. second thing is... Um, uh, what would we talk about? Um, so what would you like to talk about uh, as regards this language of wisdom, but maybe in terms of like how that could relate to projects like yours? Yeah, let, let me uh, write up something I'll send to you about how I see my language mapping into your language and possibly vice versa. How, what, okay. what I see is the 
commonalities and, and the differences and how we might resolve or talk about those. And I so, can prepare them. And so maybe we'll both do that. We'll both be prepared. Uh, and then um, maybe yeah. we could have other people help us see if they understand us or not. Because when I, <laughs> because that, did you know what I'm saying? Like that's, yes, I suffer from absolutely. that. It's like people like they just don't understand what I'm talking about. So I need to, I need that feedback. Yeah. So we'll do that. We'll have a attempt at uh, communicating basically non-verbally, like, you know, Communicating with nonverbal languages, structural languages, right? Like conceptual languages, right? right? And then maybe just a, a 30 second prayer. Um, anything beautiful to say or anything uh, lovely to well, say to finish us? I, I, I think the, and again, by changing views on prayer and God and what have you, uh, I view the universe as, as beautiful and wonderful mm -hmm. in all aspects of it. And, uh, whether God includes the universe or the universe includes God or what have you, I think it's it's the same. And it is a wondrous, beautiful thing. And we're very, very lucky to live in it. And we should try. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. You know, it's an open place. It seems to me an open place to explore ideas, and also there's expertise within the community. You know, mathematical, physics, philosophical. So, you know, someone who's interested in open exploration, you know, in a safe community. So it's kind of what it is for me.